and welcome back. Uh, we are joined by um, Big Mike from D20, and he's going Hello. to be giving us an intro into tabletop RPGs. Um, so I just want to big thank you uh, for coming here and uh, hanging out with us. There you go. You are live. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming out to Kanji Geeks at Home, the only convention out there where you can enjoy it with the comfort of your comfiest pants without having to deal with all the horrible things that, coming from, uh, that come from going outside, which includes that horrible burning thing in the sky, which keeps bothering me. Today, I will be presenting D20 Live's RPG 101 Guide, also known as the guide that Mike won't stop tinkering with. For God's sakes, stop, Mike. I need to make a PowerPoint for you. Let's begin, shall we? If you would direct yourselves to, if I'm not mistaken, the screen immediately to my left or right, I don't know how this is streaming out. Let's begin the guide. So, welcome, one, all, people, to D20 Live's Intro to Tabletop RPGs, presented by D20 Live. Clap, peons. I can hear my, <laughs> can hear my co-presenter laughing in the background. So, first of all, I got ahead of myself and clicked to the next slide before I was ready. An introduction. Tabletop RPGs, if you don't know, I'm going to cover in a point, but more importantly... This is a presentation specifically designed to give you sort of the very bare basics for those of you who are not familiar with tabletop RPGs and require a little bit additional help. Now, that being said, if you do have questions, please keep them in your pocket because I will have a Q&A section at the end, as well as, and if this is incent if those of you may be clicking away thinking, well, I already know all this stuff, I also have a QR code full of a whole bunch of free tabletop RPGs for you to enjoy that may in fact include the entire SRD for Dungeons and Dragons and they are all completely legal free resources. So let's begin with D20 Live's big ass pointers. We'll be starting with the essential skills of tabletop RPGs. How do I be good at TTRPGs and safety tools? First of all, what is a tabletop role-playing game? As tabletop role-playing games become bigger and more become bigger, more and more designers are experimenting with the limits of the term TTRPG. But at its core, a TTRPG is a simulationist role-playing game where you take on the on a the role of a character or group of characters and resolve conflicts with some kind of resolution mechanic. This is mostly done by rolling dice and applying stats to affect that roll <laughs> to, to determine how well you do. There's usually a group of players led through a scenario by someone called a game master because Wizards of the Coast likes abusing copyright law. Secondly, how is a tabletop role-playing game? More accurately, how did it come to pass? Well, long story short, Dave Ardson used Gary Gygax's Rules for Wargaming uh, which were called Chainmail, and create a role-playing experience with Gary to create a type of game where players controlled one character who could improve their skills and become a stronger character over time based on the challenges they went through. There's a lot more to it, but that whole story could be a presentation in and of itself. And, <laughs> and to be honest, you could just go read Designers and Dragons, the 70s edition, if you really want to get those details correct. However, heads up, that book is really, really sad, and um, don't read it while you're sad. Nextly. <laughs> you can tell I wrote these questions like a madman. Where is a tabletop role-playing game? More accurately, where can you purchase one? Well, in addition to any local game store that typically will sell card games like Magic the Gathering and Pokemon, numerous tabletop RPGs, including free ones, can be found at online retailers like DriveThruRPG, Bundle of Holding, Itch.io, as well as your local game store. 
Nextly, how do you become good at TTRPGs? A TTRPG is a fluid experience for you and three to five friends, depending on the game. Good isn't really a label that you can put on an experience. You can just as easily create an epic adventure that could fill a series of books with pages and pages of research and made up elvish history, as you could have a horny adventure that's resolved with shit posting. Both are viable as long as everyone is having fun. That being said, there are a few skills that common wisdom dictates it's nice to have around the table. One, as I already have up, to communicate. Now, a tabletop game is a game where 90% of what you do is done by telling people you do it. And you're because of that, you're going to have to learn how to communicate. Despite my, well, I would it says brash and genius exterior, but I flubbed about 27 lines before we got here. So despite my ham-fisted attempt at doing this, it's quite obvious that even I have challenges communicating. The point isn't to force you to communicate a certain way but to say that you should find a means to communicate with your fellow players in the way that you physically can and the way you feel comfortable to do so. The thing I'm trying to prevent is a player getting stuck in a campaign six months in and lacking the tools needed to communicate a problem or challenge the game master or players. That, however, itself could be its own presentation, but we do have to move on. That being said, there will be a thing on safety tools later on in this presentation, so don't worry. Secondly, a bit of advice, get back there, you should read the rules. <laughs> While that does seem kind of obvious, here's the funky thing about TTRPG. Sometimes you can read the core mechanic of how to do things and just stop. Sometimes you can have a rough week and forget, and sometimes you haven't played in four months and you really want to get back there but all the little minutia rules are gone. And sometimes you find a weird little mechanic that completely changes the game you've been playing up until now. And you've been playing this system for six months and how did we not learn that horses have a travel limit? Uh, don't get me wrong, not all rule systems are perfect and you don't have to perfectly stick to the letter of the rules as long as everyone at the table agrees. And the thing you'll learn most is that there's a big difference between how the rule reads and how it works in play. Lastly, you have just begun. TTRBGs, like a lot of other games, are a skill that you develop, both as a player or a game master. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to learn from them. And sometimes they're really going to suck because you were having a great time and then something bad happened and you're worried that you've ruined the experience. As long as you're willing to apologize, learn and carry forward, though, nothing's beyond getting over. Be open that you're going to change. What you want in the game is going to change. What you want in ga your gameplay experience is going to change. And that's okay. Be open to that process. Be flexible. And most of all, forgive yourself. And you will have a good time. How to be a good game master. First of all, you are designing a game. You are not writing a story. And there is a difference. In the modern age, we have a lot of tabletop shows that are well-produced and plotted and designed in advance. Because of that, a lot of game masters are feel a pressure to create a well-crafted plot before they've even spoken to or interacted with their players. That's not what makes a good tabletop game. A good game master is not writing a story for one fundamental reason. You have four to five people in front of you called players who have this wonderful thing called free will. They can choose to interact and not interact with whatever they want. And you know what? That's a good thing. A lot of novice game masters get stuck in the trap of trying to script a lot of things because they want to create that living environment, not realizing how a living environment happens. It's ignoring the one fact about the actual reality is that a lot of things that we see and interact with only exist because at some point a random person said, hey, what's in this place I know nothing about, and then went and put something there. Two, what kind of gameplay experience do you and your players want? 
a lot of novice game masters assume that story is the most important step. What they don't realize is that story will naturally emerge as you play a tabletop game, but it will be structured by the gameplay. It's really cool if you want a story that's entirely about how peaceful resolution is the answer and you shouldn't seek a violent means. But when you're playing a game like 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, where all of your experience is gained through combat, and most of your mechanics are in combat, it doesn't really hold. Before you start your game, don't even talk about the overall story. Talk to your players about what kind of mood you're, they're going for and what you want, what kind of experiences that they like in their tabletop games, as well as how hard both you and they want the challenges to overcome to be. And if you have players who say, I don't know, I've never played before, that's okay. Ask them what their favorite movies are, or especially what are their favorite video games. Take it even further. Ask them what about those games they like the most. Do they like Skyrim because of the story or the mods? I'm dating myself here. Do they like Hades because of the characters or because of the constant optimization loop? That can tell you a lot. As you start and you see how your players respond to challenges that you create, you also learn what they dislike and what they loathe. And you can start creating enemies to oppose them through that experimentation. And as they remember things and recall moments and talk about your game, you will learn more and more about what to give them and what to not take away. A popular method for getting all this is in what's called a session zero. It's a meetup before the game where mechanics are explained, plot and theme are discussed, and characters are built up and a lot more. Lastly, for this point. The illusion, is it last? Nope, I got one more point. The illusion of the pre-written module. A lot of game masters get the idea that once you have a module you've bought and paid for, you aren't supposed to change it. I'm here to tell you that's a lie. Fun fact, the narrative nature of humanity means that any retelling, no matter how faithful it is, is changed by the person who's telling the story. It's changed even more when you consider that there are four marauding well, three to five marauding psychos in your game derping their way uphill to victory. The best modules that you will find, and you'll experience this as you get more and more time as a game master, are skeletal framework for you to add, change, and adapt as you see fit because of the fact that you will have narrative emerge from the gameplay. My two favorite adventure paths of all time are Pathfinder's Kingmaker Adventure Path from the first edition and the Great Pendragon Campaign, which covers 80 years of Arthurian history and it's just and both are in empty skeletons that let me fill in blanks whatever I want based on my players experiences so if there's a particular kind of enemy encounter that stuck with them that can come back and I can fit it in while still having broad stroke points to work with uh. and lastly if you are not that creative or not, don't consider yourself creative. That's okay. A lot of game masters are not half-mad improv actors who love coming up with random plot lines. That's okay. There are countless resources online to help fill in through random encounter tables what you run into. There are numerous descriptions for scenes and environments from every GM guide you can name. And more than that, you can just tell your players you're playing a more mechanics-based, or crunchy is the popular term for it, kind of game, with less character interaction and more of a focus on set mechanics. Heck, if you have players that like to act out scenes and you don't feel comfortable as Game Master, there's no reason you they can't play the NPCs. Give them some rough suggestions and motivations and turn them loose. Don't have a big world-spanning plot? Your players will more than likely draw connections where you don't see them if they're that creative and they'll point them out to you. And then you can steal them and lie to them that it was always the plan. And if you don't know what to do next, ask them what they want. It doesn't have to be a big epic that's been thought out in advance. It can be just you and your players coming up with things together as long as you communicate that. All right. Next up, how to be a good player. Here's the first point, and it's and I hate that it's the first point, but it's always the one that comes up the most. You are not the big hero of the group. In every story, there's a leader. 
the King Arthur, a Malcolm Reynolds, Conan, Superman, or Batman, if you're like that, etc. The main character who's the focus for an audience to watch and follow. In a tabletop role-playing game, that character not only doesn't exist, they shouldn't exist. TTRPGs don't have an audience, and among those that do, the best ones don't have a main character who has the focus all the time. You are both audience and player, and so is everyone else at your table. Each person has the same perspective as you, and each of you deserve to feel your character acting effectively, making meaningful choices together, and assisting revo resolution. There are times where you will be the focus, either because of a story or you're just good at getting people's attention. But giving up that focus and helping others is just as important. Second point. Your best is yet to come. I'm going to explain this one. Some players, and this isn't necessarily bad, like to front load a lot of their story before they even start a game. This can cause a lot of trouble if your game master isn't quite ready or able to handle that much story. Additionally, if your character has resolved a lot of great things before, then why do they need to work in a team? Instead, make the reason they're working together is because they need the help of others. You're a muscle-bound fighter. You're dealing with a magical curse in your family. You're a wizard with arcane secrets. The book you need to complete your trainings is in the jerk baron's house surrounded by traps. These are just reductive examples. The point is, you need these people to help you achieve a goal. That goal can be as tragic as dead loved ones, or as simple as adventuring looks like a really good way to make money and I want to retire rich. I have literally made a character called Jed who was a level one fighter. He was an ex-gladiator who came to the shocking realization that he could grow his own farm food, live free on a farm. He was then dedicated to traveling the world to learn farming techniques while earning money as an adventurer. No, my GM didn't like it. The point is that no matter how much your character might have accomplished prior to now, the part where you control that character now has to be the best part of their story. Otherwise, why else would you be playing this part? So keep that in mind. Nextly, or lastly, the spark of life. There's a moment where characters go from being a good idea to absolutely amazing. Some people call it the spark, others call, describe it as a line you have to cross, or what have you. At some point while building a character, someone whose skin you'll be in for two to four hours a week, you'll only need to ask one question. What is the most important part of this character to me? What's the core of the character? So that way when things go off hinge, or off book, or off the rails, where, where are they going to be? Usually, that's an emotion. That farmer guy, the one I mentioned earlier, sure, the sentence sounds good. But what drives him is that sense of wonder, discovery, delight. It means he's not afraid to explore, to adapt, to learn new things. He's got an appreciation of the strange. That's the core. That's the emotion. If you can find that for your own character, suddenly you'll see their interactions through that lens. It takes time. Be patient. You'll find it. And yes, it is okay to copy a character from your favorite movie, TV show, and video game. If your fellow players call you out for it or say that you're doing it wrong, they're the jerk. If it inspired you, use it. Up next, what are safety tools? Safety tools are means for players and game masters to communicate with each other about subject matters that they might feel uncomfortable. For long established groups, there's usually informal frameworks put in place over years of learning how to communicate with each other. But it never hurts to have a backup system that's in place if you're just not able to say what's wrong in an open conversation. And so, let's go through some of the more common safety tools. First of all, there's the X card. The original safety tool. It's considered crude, and it does attract a lot of criticism, but you can't talk about safety tools without it. The principle is that at any time a player feels they are dealing with uncomfortable subject matter, for whatever reason, they can touch an X. Either they use it as a card, or it's on the table, or they message the GM privately, or they just do this. In concept, the scene is supposed to stop or move on, and hopefully the person who used it can offer more information. Next, lines and veils. This is something for before the game in a session zero. The players and game master discuss what subject matter is absolutely not to be allowed within a game, which is considered a line, and what is allowed to be present in the world, but not something that 
to be directly interacted with or addressed for more than a few seconds before moving on. Avail. Stars and Wishes. While not technically a safety tool in the strictest sense, it's a means by which players can communicate what they like and what they want from, from the game. A star is what's given from, from players or the game master to anyone or anything they loved about the game. A wish is a request for things that a player or game master would like to see in the game from specific kind of characters, mechanics, or any other kind of element they want more of. And then, of course, there's the golden rule of table top game safety. None of these things will work if you don't actively listen to what someone is telling you. And a bit of common sense here, if you have a player that just went on an awful date, maybe it's not a good idea to have a really slimy succubus or incubus villain show up that day. Or maybe it is and they just want to get some sweet vengeance. You can use safety tools and methods all day, but if you aren't actively using what they teach you, then there's no point. They are there to help you communicate, not to avoid communicating. And now, some of the more frequently asked questions I get. First of all, what system should I play or start with? The answer, the one that looks cool. And I'm not kidding about this. The more interested you are in a system, the more passion you'll have for it. It's not about what's more difficult, more crunchy, more simulationist, more role-playing focused, what have you. It's whatever you are interested in. You'll have an easier time learning it because you're interested in it. You'll have an easier time selling it because you're interested in it. And it'll be easier to get other people interested in it. What if I feel my character would do something that would deliberately piss off my fellow players? Come on. Don't do it. There's a difference between playing an aloof character who's a bit antisocial, but looking for meaningful connections deep down, and playing an asshole who actively goes against the goals and the, the rest of the group are trying to achieve. No matter what your character is, you are still a person working with your fellow players to achieve a goal, communicate out of game, work together. Or if you are going to be that antagonist character, communicate that up front so the players know that's where you're going naturally. When is it okay to railroad? Just don't. If you paid attention so far, you've learned that having a plan is the first step to watching that plan burn and fall off a cliff. If you want your players to go in a specific direction, talk to them. Ask what parts they like. Get their feedback about what parts they choose to pursue. Don't force them or trick them. They'll see it, and then they'll sigh. Remember, you're empowering their choices, not restricting them. What if I can't afford X game? Like I said, the most popular tabletop game right now is Dungeons and Dragons, and they released all their rules for free online, and there are multiple tools for them. And we also still have that wonderful QR code coming at the end of this presentation to help fill you in. But there are countless free one-page RPGs, starter versions, and so many resources, resources online to help you. I just started game mastering. What's a good way to practice? Short games. Don't start doing long campaigns when you just started out. Run short, one session, two session games, where you sit there for a couple hours with your friends, have some fun, feel out your group. Who do you like playing with? Who do you not like playing with? Who makes you feel comfortable? What elements are you having an easy time doing? What elements do you have a hard time doing with? What do you have to work on? Run short stuff. You will get better you will improve, and you can move on to different systems once you feel you've got them down, or explore the rules even further. Lastly, the free stuff. On the screen is a lovely QR code that I'm going to leave for a few seconds, so that you can all take a picture of it, run through a QR code scanner, and then go online to get D20 Live's free list of tabletop games and resources that you can just have that are yours to use. So I'm going to leave that up for a few seconds. Or we can go back to it after. <clears throat> and
And that concludes my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? I hope so. You did have a question here. What was that? Uh, what if the group needs to get caught and brought together in order to form a party? So the question is, what if the group get gets caught and needs to be brought together to form a party? Thank you, Sam. Hello. Hello. Okay, so in the case of what if the group what if the group needs to be caught and brought together in order to form a party? Now, I if I'm understanding the question correctly, you is that I'm assuming that's how you want them to start the game, in which case you tell them that that this is the direction you're going in. You communicate this is how it's going to get hooked in. Or if the question means that you're having a hard time bringing them together, again, tell them that you're having that challenge and you're going to use these methodologies to bring them together. Why would you want to be an asshole while playing with a group of people? You wouldn't, but sometimes people don't have the best day. Sometimes they get really in deep in a character. Generally speaking, you want to work together, or you're you're playing someone who is technically in the game an asshole, air quotes. But that's a relative term. Depends. Okay. There are a ton in the comments above. Is anyone willing to repeat their questions? Let's see here. Hey kids, who wants to talk about? I don't think that's thing. Can you use the X card to stop another player from forcing your character to using into doing something uncomfortable? Yes, you can. But you should communicate to the game master. That's why you're using it. How do you get into character if you're having problems relating? I covered that a little bit earlier. Um, try to, and I'll restate it. Try to pick a core emotion. That uh, that's sort of the lens through which your character works. So in this case, it would be, let's say you're playing uh, a fighter who is enjoys exploring. He has a sense of wonder. So you are excited. You are trying to get into the world and invested in it and things like that. Okay. Do you have any additional questions? Do do. 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 Big Mike, what if the players can't think of how they want to move the story forward? Well, depending on the game, there's a couple options. There is, oh no, new monster, or <laughs> if the players can't and the game master can't, there are numerous resources online that'll help you come up with tabletop plots, and those these can be very bare bones. Uh, one of the ones that I most commonly use is something called Donjon, which creates fantasy RPG plots as well as things for deep space and other kinds of adventures. And there are numerous, numerous table resources of plot threads and concepts online that you can just do and roll for random encounter tables and just randomly say you found a group of goblins who've stolen something or um, something's going on in the village and a beloved NPC that you've met up to this point is gone. There are very, there are many, many resources for that. As a potential new player, how can I minimize the impact I have by my lack of knowledge? I always worry about that if I do start, I'll just annoy everyone by slowing things down. Now, I'm going to assume lack of knowledge of either the world or the system. Um, so those are the two cases that come to mind in this one, when this question. If you don't know the system, a lot of play. if you are up front that you don't have a good knowledge of the system itself, excuse me, feel free to communicate that before you start with everyone. Say that you're going to be asking people for advice. Ask who's comfortable giving you advice on how to play the game, on where the points are. And so you can have that conversation as an aside while the main focus is somewhere else. Take And there is always downtime in a tabletop game, especially in combat, where you have a chance to check out rules and do that while, again, the main focus is on someone else's turn. I mean, if there, uh, if it's in terms of mechanics, ask the game master for help. Ask for clarifications. Ask your fellow players. 
the game can always be stopped, okay? You are not in a fluid experience. Every video game, except for, you know, the Souls-like games, has a pause button. That's true for tabletop. If you and your friend, even if you feel like you're stopping things for your friends, as long as you communicate that you will, that you need that help, people will adjust their expectations accordingly, as long as they know it's coming. You're not diffusing a bomb. Yeah, you're not diffusing a bomb. You're just saying, hey guys, I've been having trouble with the rules for the last couple of weeks. Can I ask questions as we go along this week before you start? And you will have cleared that expectation. I mean, if they're stuck in a situation and can't figure out how to get out of it. Uh, as someone who's gotten players into that, you can just make suggestions to them and just give them hints. This is, like I said, the versillimitude wall between player and game master, It does. it's not that bit as big as it gets built up to be. You can suggest the path you've thought of. They can ignore it and pound their way through the walls. But as they... Part of taking people through a tabletop game as a game master is cultivating their expectations. And you are teaching them how to play your game. And a lot of game masters get into this idea of that the game is just the rules. It's not. The rules control how resolution happens, but the game itself exists because the game master has built it. You are teaching them how to play your game. And you got to communicate that effectively. Is there any advice you have for playing off online? All my in-person campaigns have petered out for various real-life reasons, and I'm interested in playing online. I'm unsure how to go about... Oh, I missed one right above that. I'll get to that in a second. Do you have any tips for setting up a game in an established city like London or Detroit? <laughs> Alternatively, is there such a thing as doing too much research on a ki uh, city for your campaign? Okay. So, um, it's kind of funny. I'm going to scroll back a bit so I don't lose this question. Uh, you should answer the, the how to play it online. Well, because the, the, the established setting was first. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm answering that one first. Um, <laughs> there's two ways to do it. Um, there's one, you uh, are doing it from the perspective of, some, of a group that is actively enjoying investigating the city as they're going through it as though it's established. Or you just make stuff up. Seattle is one of the most, is a very popular location for Shadowrun, but Shadowrun Seattle does not exist, and it's something that is fluid in an environment. Be feel free to create things that are there because any tabletop game you have already is going to add things to that and displace things, even in the most realistic setting. Is there such a thing as doing too much research? Not necessarily. But it's not about the research you do, it's how you give that information. If you stop the flow of it, of the adventure too much and give that in a way that contradicts what people are doing, that can be challenging. But if you are talking to the game master and saying, like, here's a thing you need to know about someplace like Detroit. Did you know that Detroit has a cult problem and that parts of its city make a perfect pentagram? It'll work. If you... Um, It'll work quite well. But you just got to be conscientious about interrupting the flow. Now, going back to the question I read earlier by accident, is there any advice you have for playing online? Yes. All my in-person games have petered out for various real-life reasons. I'm interested in playing online. I'm unsure about how to go about doing it. Well, this is what I do, and it works for me so far, because despite the fact that, we, that a lot of people have been doing uh, remote tabletop uh, role-playing for the last two years. I don't think anyone found a consistently good way to do it. What usually goes with me and my group of friends is we all stream from, we all play in Discord with web cameras and microphones, and we do our rolling through a virtual tabletop like Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds. We mostly use Roll20 because we very much talk, we talk much faster and we don't have a lot of prep, so we just have a, usually a map, and that's it. My throat's going very dry because I'm overcoming a cold. Give me one moment. Um, in terms of finding people for online play, um, it's the same as you would for finding people in person. You would talk to friends, see who's interested. Social media posts, not open ones, obviously, because you don't want some random jerk to think uh, to ruin your day. Or you now, here's the good thing about post pandemic is nowadays you can actually have go to the discords for the tabletop RPGs you do like. Or just general tabletop RPG discords, and you can go to Reddit to find some of these. Um, or you can join ours. 
Or you can join the D20 Live Discord and say there's games you want to play. Thank you, Sam. Or you can join the D20 Live Discord and talk about the games you want to play and make a group there. What rules light system would you recommend, Mike, for easy setup, go and play? There are two, depending, I currently recommend that are easy to get that are accessible now. One is Fate Accelerated. Uh, the other is po the Powered by Apocalypse rule system. So, unfortunately, with Fate Accelerated is a general sorry, Fate Accelerated is a general rules ones where you can build whatever you want out of it. Powered by the Apocalypse, you have to find a sy the system built around it. So, if you want more of a stream of consciousness kind of flows naturally, and you can end things as you go along, Fate Accelerated. If you want more of a structured narrative path and more of your less of your choices are focused around combat and more around developing the plot i would pick a power by apocalypse game like worldwide wrestling or thirsty sword lesbians if a character has a secret non-dangerous they want hidden from the other players how do you stop the other players from trying to uncover it before they are ready tell them out of game just tell them out of game have that conversation and say i don't want this to come up yet Talk to the game master about where you want it to get revealed. And then in game say, I'm not ready to talk about it yet. Tell them out of game. That is the advantage of tabletop role playing that you can just say things to the player. Please don't. <sighs> Any suggestions for people who really like the idea of playing but are struggle with improv? Yes. Ironically... <laughs> You're going to want to focus on systems that have a lot of combat and have crunchier rules to replace the role-playing uh, role elements. And the good news is, up until the last 10 years or so, that was the majority of tabletop role-playing games. Had a great focus on mechanics and the crunch and, and going through the system over directly needing role-playing results but if you want the systems that i like that don't necessarily have a role-playing focus these are games like dungeon crawl classics pathfinder first and second edition the lancer tabletop role-playing game what else do i have that would make a good example that doesn't need to focus on role-playing generally a lot of osr stuff is really good for that uh pendragon's role-playing game is really good for a combat simulationist uh place generally a lot of dungeon crawl games Hmm, I wonder why virtual can hashtag virtual. Some local comic shops have discords too, as well. We are a pretty fun community. Until I came home, that is. So Dungeon World? Uh, Dungeon World, I've heard... Dungeon World, I've heard, is a good system, but I've heard there's been some controversial things about it, so I'm hesitant to list Dungeon World until I sort out what that controversial thing is. Because some people will play it and they love it, but then there's been apparently some controversy with some of the devs involved. Thank you, Dark the Dense Boy, for the dis Discord link. Uh, for the Discord link. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? I think I got through them pretty quickly, actually, but we still have like another 10 minutes of me being here. So a lot of these people are from the D20 Live Discord, and they hit only 2.30. How are you and Sam doing? We're good. She's right. Sam, come and say hi. So for those of you who do not know, I am Big Mike from D20 Live. This is Sam, our production manager, and also my wife. Hello. She made the lovely PowerPoint presentation, which I have pretty much screwed up the beginning of. It's okay. You're fine. You flew through that. It was lovely. <laughs> I've gotten more concise. That's the problem. I'm not rambling as much as I used to. Uh, but yeah, please feel free to ask me any other questions or come to the d20 live discord and ask them there but you got me for another what seven minutes i believe 15 <laughs> tell a story how about that um but yeah the okay go i'm gonna go back a little bit on some of the other point where when are you gonna run me through my game how much should i fear story <laughs> oh okay um 
Okay, I'm going to answer the first one. Uh, Tom Barry, if you actually want... Uh, Tom Barry, I did not know you actually wanted me to run you through a game. If you want to play one, you let me know. I'll get you in one. How much should I fear? How much do you want to be afraid? For context, Tom Barry is one of our mods. Yeah, Tom Barry has been one of the better, one of our the D20 Live mods, and she has gone above and beyond uh, and has helped us out at many conventions she has been at. And for moderators of D20 Live, I'm more than happy to run them games. Any TTRPGs to actively avoid? Um, okay, so there's the there is yes, yes there are. <laughs> oh God, are there? There have been people out there with very, um, very um, non left leaning ideals, uh, and they have TTRPG games that they have made, which I do not recommend. Um, it's hard to remember them all, actually, because most recently, someone, one of Gary Gygax's children actually tried to recreate, bring back TSR. Mm -hmm. And every system that came out of that had very strong racist overtones, especially, um, so if you see anything by what's called new TSR, just avoid it. The big one everyone will tell you about to avoid, uh, and I, it's a, to the point where it's practically a meme, is called Fatal. Which some people justify in playing is saying it's a huge way to troll people, but no, it's a horrible game. Don't play it. <laughs> Could have mentioned Fatal is bad for my sake. Um, uh, other games that I pers personally, a game I avoid, but it's very popular, is Bluebeard's Bride, largely because it is about a group of players playing different aspects of a woman's mind as she evades her murderer husband while the setting is interesting is great the horror elements are great the fact that part of the game elements is involves gaslighting other players is not something i can really recommend but i've heard many people having a good time with it um i would be wary of any game where a good chunk of the mechanics involves forcing other players to take actions they don't want to uh don't forget to uh, avoid uh oh, flame princess yeah I would avoid that one as well. Again, for the same controversial dev reasons as Dungeon World. Uh, I have questions, but they are a little long and specific for a Marvel character I've envisioned. Can't really talk to anyone else about it unless live. And if you have long, specific uh, character build questions, come to the D20 Live Discord. We will help you pound it out, even if I'm not the one there. What is a game that you are interested in playing but haven't had a chance to try yet? Oh, let's talk about that list, shall we? First of all, I want to run Dungeon Crawl Classics because it sounds... Because here's the thing. Dungeon Crawl Classics is a tribute to the original style role-playing games of, like, original D&D &D and all those classic simulationist games. But it's also a little cartoony because there's, like, a million ways to die. You don't actually gain experience by beating things. You get experience by surviving them. And you get one experience for everything. They have... You can be a lawful evil thief in that game and you will level up and become a mafia head leader. That's just what happens. Um, other games I'm curious about, I've been checking out Sword World and I haven't had the opportunity to play it. I've wanted, which is um, Japan's answer to Dungeons and Dragons. It recently got brought over here through the Goblin Slayer RPG, but I'm not a huge fan of Goblin Slayer, but I had the game recommended to me. I've been checking it out and I found out that it has unlimited leveling and you can multi-level however you want. And I like that. And it tickles me, but it drives me crazy. Um, other games I want to try out. I very much want to try out... You can probably look up that back, too. Oh, uh, is it the QR code? The QR okay. code, because we're just talking. Yeah, there's the QR code for the free stuff. Um, and that is, of course, on the D20 Live Discord. Uh, what else? I'm trying to go through all the other ones uh, I've been trying to check out. I won't talk about the really wonky one that I found recently. Just come to D20 Live and we'll talk about it there. But this is, You want to do Deadlands at some point. I very much want to do Deadlands. Deadlands is basically, if you're familiar with the Evil Dead movies, but they're cowboys, and also you have miniguns and super science and death rays. Yes. <laughs> I shouldn't... Also, to preface, there is there are some Deadlands books that do not depict Native American cultures well, just warning you ahead of time. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. But uh, some of them don't have them. Yeah. It's a matter of getting the right ones. Um, what else is on my list? Yeah, RuneQuest I very much want to play because it's a Bronze Age uh, fantasy adventure game where you get your own cult. But I haven't wrapped my brain around it and it drives me crazy. I want to run Aegon. 
and play an Aegon, the Greek adventure RPG. Oh, so many. So many. None of time. Tenra Bansha Zero. Um, I want to run Anima, which is still to this day the most complex Japanese role-playing game I've ever found in my life because it has the Kabbalah in it as part of your stat block. It's a game where you can have key points, magic, and be a sword fighter all at the same time. And you just have to track it all. It's got like four-page character sheet, and that tickles me as a madman. Free stuff. Cool. In Deadlands, vampire werewolves are evil, correct? Three words on another note of D20 Life. The antics, flaming Zamboni deathmatch, thanks to Power by the Apocalypse. Yeah. I haven't seen any new questions come in. That's We're still on the games I have interested in playing but haven't had a chance to play yet. Yeah. The problem is... All my ta all my best tabletop stories are have happened on D20 Live. Just a couple of weeks ago, we've been running an ongoing campaign with guests called Star Wars Let's Kill Darth Vader, where a group of Mandalorians are attempting to kill Darth Vader. But they're not really Mandalorians. They were trained by a mall ninja guy named Jeff the Mandalorian. And they have derped their way onto the Executor, and they managed to evade Darth Vader by pretending to be strippers. He's mad, and he's hunting them actively now. Just a What's the RPG with raccoons? Oh, that's Root. I think you're talking about Root because there's two. Um, Root is the tabletop RPG game made by um, made by Magpie Games, the guys who made the Root board game. But rather than you playing the different factions of Root, you play a mercenary in Root. What about Starfinder? I like Starfinder, but Starfinder hasn't grabbed me quite yet. I've had a, I've had this weird on and off relationship with Starfinder. I haven't quite gotten the plot. You have a character, not a plot. Yeah, which is an assassin bear, because it's mechanically good. Crash pandas? I don't know what that is. You can play as raccoons in Iron Claw. Yep, an RPG without alignment, traditional hit points, or even D20s. Yeah, I think I think they're talking about root though. It's either Iron Claw or root. There's a lot of little furry animal RPGs. The, I think the most... There's Pugmire as there's well. There's Pugmire, which is actually going out of print, I think. Oh, no. Yeah. Where you play as dogs. Uh, there's Cats of Cthulhu. There's... Um, and, of course, the most classic one, Mouse Guard, where you play as mice in an Arthurian legend kind of story. Sometimes having a character and not applause the way to go. Yeah, but he's just an assassin bear with a knife. Bear assassin or bear assassin. Yes. <laughs> And he's a master of disguise, so very frequently. It's just Sir Barrington. It's this a Sir Barrington meme, though. But as an assassin in space. As an assassin in space, who's actively trying to kill people around the players. Do we have any other questions as I keep trying to hydrate myself? Sometimes. There's also Pony Fighter Finder, which is my little pony meets Pathfinder with the serial numbers filled off, and I've, I, which is another one that I've heard nothing but weirdly good things about. And then, of course, is the My Little Pony game itself. Uh, yeah, no. There, I'm trying to think of the the dumber. It hadn't made it to stream games that I've had, but the best one is still kind of my king make old kingmaker game. Well, in my game too. In your game, but you, that was your game, not mine. You can talk about it. Pants gang. Okay. <laughs> so I need to explain the pants gang. So I'm running a cyberpunk red game with my friends whenever we have a missing player for our exalted game. In the first game that we did, which was a one shot, they ripped the pants off of the guy who robbed them, which led to them stealing his car and his stash, his bug out bag, which contained money and cocaine, because it's a cyberpunk style of drugs, which is because it's a cyberpunk style game. They have since dedicated themselves to stealing the pants of every major antagonist they have come across. They have stolen Saburo Arasaka's pants, who is the major villain of the cyberpunk universe. But no one believes us. But no one believes that they've done it. There is a bounty on their head for $50 by Saburo Arasaka. No one believes it's real. And they are actively calling themselves the Pants Gang. They are regarded as a myth because no one could be this stupid. What are easier class characters to play? Um, if you're talking about like 5th edition characters, those are more physically adept martial characters like fighters and warriors and things like that. Right, uh, even. Rogues aren't too bad, but you got to think tactically about how you're engaging in the scene. If you're thinking about going straight forward, mm -hmm. I would say you, your pure pugilists are usually the best way to go. Avoid magic players. Yeah, don't do magic. don't do magic, don't do magic. But 
Magic requires you to think a little bit. A lot. A Did you want to grab like a stool or something so they can see you in the scene? I'll just do this. i will just do this and be cute. I'll be cute. Fifty dollars, but not their own pants. <laughs> yeah, the the every time they encounter Sabra Arasaka, the bounty goes up by like ten bucks. He wants to kill them, but he doesn't want to say that it's a big deal. I did an elf age the first time I played third edition. Not a good fit. Yeah, some people can drop right into magic if you're, but magic uh, for a lot of traditionally fantasy games involves pre-playing the spells you want, learning how they work and when they thematically work. If you go that route, it is incredibly rewarding because it teaches you how to think tactically, how to interact well with the world, and to use more than just the attack spells to get the results you want. And it's a rewarding experience, but if you need something easy, straight up melee. If you dislike old spellcasting in D&D, blame the author, Jeff. It's true. Um, that The reason why um, Wizards and Dungeons and Dragons have spell slots per day is because of the novels of Jack Vance, the Dying Earth novels. And the idea was that magic was dying, and because it was dying, Wizards couldn't cast willy-nilly. And Gary Gygax liked it so much he put it in his game. Are you? I cast Magic Missile. Are you attacking the darkness? Yep, but you never hit because the real darkness is inside yourself. Are you hidden emo kid or a classic girl in rock band? Where is the Cheetos? Uh, due to a Cheeto incident where I licked my hands and then put them in the bag, Cheetos have been banned at the D20 live table ever since. Stop hitting yourself. Well, now we're just quoting stuff. Now we're just quoting stuff. Does anyone have any more questions? Because I think we're near the... puts Cheetos in a fridge? Though. No, Mountain Dew, honey. I know, but the Cheetos were in the fridge next to the Mountain Dew. Why? I don't know. Who puts Cheetos in the fridge? I don't know. <clears throat> I don't think we have any more questions. Such a good... <laughs> any idea for ideas for handling absentee players? Run pants gig. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the game you're running. Uh, some games allow drop-in, drop-out players. Some games clearly don't. Um, it really depends. Sometimes players just skip. Uh, sometimes they run with two. It depends on the mood. It's it's such a subjective thing in this day and age because it depends on the game you're playing, the rhythm of your group as a whole, and just where you were narratively. Sometimes you'll have to skip. What I do is I have a backup game of Cyberpunk where just a job will come in and whoever's available gets called in on the job. The job's done over one session and we all move on. We blow off steam with it. Or I run a one-shot. Lasers and Feelings is a really good game that you yeah. can run on one-shot. It's a one-page RPG and it's mm -hmm. stupidly easy. <laughs> or if you want to run... Oh, what's the name of the mecha one-page mecha RPG we were running for a while? Oh, I can't remember. New Type. New Type. That was the yeah. good one, too. If you want to do mechs, one-page RPGs are great for one-night parties. We had, there was one from Grant Howitt, the guy who made the Honey Bear Heist games, and his Lover Not a Fighter Sword game is really fun. I want to go back to that. <laughs> Stupid easy. <laughs> Boy, I like Stupid Easy. One page RPGs. There is a dearth of them. They've been getting more and more prolific. They're in the free stuff. And they are all in the free stuff. <laughs> Grant Howitt has literally made a career out of making a free one-page RPG once a week for like the last two, three years. Tactical Waifu. <laughs> At any rate. Yeah, we uh, are pretty much out of time. Con Dragon, how have I served you well this day? I think Con is pleased. <laughs> Thank you so much, Big Mike. Um... And thank you for your assistance hiding out in the background, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, if anyone missed that, the QR code is for free stuff, so you should um, yeah. click it. And, and the, um, or take and the living account. document is also in our Discord. So come over there and check it out, and we'll keep getting updated with we find more stuff. Yeah, you can go over to get our links. <laughs> yes. I put that at the end of oh, the PowerPoint. Oh, nice. So, I didn't know you put it there. I did. Okay, let me do that. Ta-da! Ta-da! Links! Oh. <laughs> All our stuff! <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, 
again, big round of applause. Thank you very much for, for coming out and doing this. It was very informative. Um, and I want to remind any of our uh, viewers right now, we are doing this as a fundraiser for the Canadian Mental Health Association National. Um, if you donate to our Kofi, if you donate five or more dollars, um, you get put into a draw for a custom t-shirt by the HodgePodge Pony. Um, and if you donate $10 or more, you get put in that draw and you get a sticker of Khan with his laptop um, sent, sent to you. So um, just to say thank you for donating to a good cause. Um, and thank you very much, Mike. You're very welcome. All right. I believe I am out. You all have a lovely convention. Thank you.